When I was asked to participate in today's lecture, I was more than a little hesitant. In light of the other speakers today, I wasn't too sure what I was doing here. And immediately after, I was finally cajoled into accepting. There were two omens which I didn't think uh, bore well for the future. My apartment was burglarized and I got viral pneumonia. So I want you to know that I learned from these little hints and I am leaving the country in 48 hours and uh, so I hope there'll be no aftermath of this speech. You will be getting my paper and I'm not going to, you'll be glad to know, go back to the Roman law as my paper does. I'm going to start in the 1970s. My paper deals with corroboration for those of you in the civil field who have no idea what Betrovic and Gaja was about. In Canada, before 1976, there seemed to be certain things one could say with some degree of certainty, one hoped, about what was considered to be corroborative. The way in which the law worked was that it was for the judge to tell the jury what could be corroborative, and it was for the jury to make findings of fact as to whether a particular piece of evidence was corroborative. There were certain categories that each piece of evidence had to be measured against. And unless it met each and every one of these tests, it was not in law capable of being corroborative. They included that the evidence tendered had to be independent of the witness whose evidence one wanted to support. For example, in the Ontario Court of Appeal case of Regina and White, a bloodied Kleenex was found in the car in which the victim alleged she'd been raped. That was not considered to be independent because apart from her explanation as to what role this bloody Kleenex played, it had no probative value whatsoever. Also, quite naturally, the evidence had to support a material particular of the evidence of the suspect witness. Simply peripheral details were not of great assistance. Another requirement was that the evidence had to be more consistent with the guilt than the innocence of the accused. Of course, you have to remember this was when we had Hodge's rule and that was quite in keeping with the way in which we dealt with circumstantial evidence. In addition, you needed not only show that some of this independent evidence supported the fact that there was a crime committed, but it had to link the accused, the identity of the accused, as the perpetrator of the offense. In 1972 in England, an evolution began about how we viewed corroboration. The motivation behind this appears to have been an increasing view first stated in, in England and then in Canada, but the law had simply become complex, and to borrow a term from Mr. Justice Martin, very mechanical. You looked to see if the evidence met the criteria, you didn't think about what it was there to do, and if it met the criteria, in it went, it was corroboration. Lord Diplock in the Hester judgment talked about the fact that dealing particularly with corroboration in small children, the complicated formula around the concept of corroboration and the respective functions of judge and jury are, I believe, unintelligible to the ordinary layman, even when only one witness whose evidence called for corroboration is involved. Similarly, in that case, there began a movement towards the word, away from the word corroboration. Lord Diplock said, an examination of the basic 19th century cases makes it clear the corroboration was not used in any sense other than confirmation. As is later said, there's no magic in that one word. Similarly, in the Kilbourne decision by the House of Lords, they indicated that all you're really looking for is some independent evidence, making it more probable than not that the suspect witness's evidence was true. There were two major cases decided on the same day in the Supreme Court of Canada, which changed the law considerably. They were decided on July 16, 1976. They were Regina and Murphy and Butt and the Workington decision. Both of these cases, it's important to remember, dealt with a statutory requirement of corroboration, which was very, very similar to the old Baskerville test which in the statute had all of the criteria I've just mentioned above. In Murphy and Butt, one of the major issues was whether the victim's distraught condition could corroborate her evidence as to the facts of the rape. Not surprisingly, it was argued on behalf of the appellants that that was clearly not independent 
but the court seemed to feel in part that because other witnesses testified to her distraught condition, that that was some evidence which might be corroborative. They did acknowledge that if this condition had not been noticed for some number of hours after the rape, that that would certainly play heavily as to what weight it would have, but it was admissible. The major issue in that case dealt in part with whether the evidence could be used against both of the appellants. It was an important factual distinction. The appellant Murphy acknowledged that he had had intercourse with the complainant, but said it was consensual. Both the majority and minority judgment said on that basis, the evidence of her condition could be used to corroborate her evidence. However, the appellant but denied having intercourse, so one of the issues that had to be proved in addition to consent was his identity as someone who had had intercourse with her. The dissenting judgment felt that on that basis, her condition could in no way link the appellant but to commission of that offense, and as a result of that, it could not be used against him. The Workington decision, again, involved a gang rape situation, again under the old statutory conditions. In that case, the appellants had argued that you needed corroboration about three things for each individual accused. And with three accused, that now means you had to deal with nine different categories of evidence. The issues were intercourse, lack of consent, and the identity of the accused. The Supreme Court of Canada and the majority strongly rejected this position, it said that it was artificial and hopeless, and that what one had to look for was overall evidence linking this group of people with this offense, and you did not have to individually link these defendants with independent evidence. The majority judgment, Mr. Justice de Grandpre said, I'm satisfied that the corroborative evidence of which section 142 speaks need not identify each accused separately when the evidence to be corroborated is that a gang rape has been committed. Now some people valiantly tried to suggest this is a brand new law of corroboration only in gang rapes. But not surprisingly, this was not a very successful point when they tried to argue it, notwithstanding the opening comment. Many commentators felt that these two cases were beginning to show a very important movement away from two of the old requirements, which defense counsel particularly felt very important. Those were the necessity that the evidence be independent from that of the complainant, which was highlighted in the Murphy and Butt case when the evidence of the complainant's condition was considered independent of her. And in Workington and in Murphy and Butt, there was a real question as to what sort of evidence you needed linking the accused specifically to the offense as opposed to the conditions of the offense generally. However, notwithstanding those apparent distinctions in watering down that the commentators saw, the dredging decision to which Mr. Justice Martin just referred indicated that there appeared not to be this dilution. In fact, the judgment says both the majority and minority judgments accept the proposition that evidence to be corroborative must implicate the accused in the commission of the offense. They find nothing in those two decisions which appears to depart from those principles. With the greatest of respect, I don't think that that was a very tenable position, and I think since Vetrovic, it's very clear that that is not what the Supreme Court of Canada intended. In support of its position that independence had not been watered down, the court in the dredging case referred to their earlier decision of Boyce, which had referred to the need of independent evidence confirming the vital issues. And while it is true that was quoted in the Workington decision, in light of the very clear comment that you need not have evidence linking all of the accused, certainly that criteria appeared to be disappearing. The last matter I wish to deal with prior to discussing the Vetrovic decision is what was the effect if you did find there was some evidence capable of being corroborative. In Ontario, it was clear that it was an error in law for the court to then tell the jury that if they found there was corroboration, there was then no danger in relying on the, wit the complainant or accomplice's evidence. This also now appears to be in some doubt. It's my position that one of the major reasons why the court has taken the position it did in Vetrovic and Gaja has to do with its rejection of the traditional rationales 
which had been proposed in favor of the accomplice rule. It's very surprising when I was preparing for this paper that very few of the cases, either in Canada or Britain, discuss the rationale behind the rule at any length at all. In Horsburgh, however, the dissenting judgment did discuss the rationale and this, the dissent did not relate to this issue. Mr. Justice Ritchie said, the rule appears to have its origin in the old law respecting approvers which fell into disuse in the first half of the 18th century and under which a person who is in custody and who had been indicted for an offense for which the accused was charged could, upon confessing his guilt and accusing the accomplice, obtain his pardon. Now, needless to say, that was rather important in the old days because if you were convicted, you stood a good chance of being hanged, so that the incentive perhaps was even stronger than it is now. In addition, in that case, they talk about the fact that the major concern is what the accomplice wants throughout the entire proceeding is the most lenient treatment for himself. As a result of this, many courts had said it's much better if we first convict and sentence the accomplice and then he gives his evidence. They seem to feel that this greatly lessens the danger that the accomplice may lie. However, it's my respectful submission that the far more realistic view was expressed by Mr. Justice Martin in Regina in Meston. He said, the rule with respect to the danger of acting upon the uncorroborated evidence of an accomplice does not cease when he has either been convicted or acquitted. Because once having told a story that he was under the influence of a charge and subject to the motives previously mentioned, i.e., to procure lenient treatment for himself, it is likely that he would adhere to that story on a subsequent occasion. Now, it's my submission that that's a very important thing to keep in mind. And it has been my experience that what really determines who's going to be the accomplice and who's going to be the accused, two major factors that often have a play. One is who gets to the, the police first or who the police get to first. And another factor is where is your fellow on the totem pole? If you have an accused who is low man on the scale of either a fraud offense, for example, or a drug offense, and the police are very concerned that they will be unable to prove the charges against the kingpins of this offense without the evidence of the accomplice, the chances of you being able to work out some sort of an arrangement improve dramatically. And it's important to remember, as I note later in my paper, that quite properly, none of the deals that Crown attorneys make with any accomplices give them any immunity from prosecution for perjury. And that's a very important consideration. Once they're tied to their story at the time of their arrest, and often they've testified, for example, at a preliminary hearing, it's highly unlikely that they're going to take the chance down the road after they've been sentenced to say, that was all just a joke, guys. I made up that story in order to procure lenient treatment for myself, and the truth is that this poor fellow is innocent and someone else is involved. However, Wigmore staunchly rejected all of these theories and said that there need not be such concern just because someone's been given immunity. It doesn't turn them into an automatic liar. And that as soon as one admits that in fact he is in the position of an accomplice, then we shouldn't be so worried about him. It appears it's largely because of the Supreme Court of Canada's acceptance of Wigmore's very narrow view of when accomplice warnings are appropriate, that the accomplice rule has gone by the boards to a great degree. In Vetrovic and Gaja, the single most important comment is the obvious one, which is that there is no longer a special category of witnesses known as accomplices. One of the major changes in that decision are the situations in which someone is now to be considered a witness we need to be concerned about. One of the things that they set out is, if an accomplice openly acknowledges he's been involved in the offense, if there is agreement as to the role in which the accomplice played at the time of the offense, or if the accomplice knows he's going to be prosecuted later no matter what he says, 
then it appears the Supreme Court of Canada judgment says we need give no warning. It's my submission that it's hard to understand why the fact that a criminal readily admits that he is in fact a criminal helps you get rid of the concerns you have about his credibility. I think that perhaps there's an interesting analogy in the recent case of Gonzague. That's a case that dealt with a situation dealing with criminal records. The trial judge had instructed the jury in that case because the accused readily admitted his very lengthy criminal record that that somehow made him a truthful person because that's the only reason why we asked him about his record anyway to see if he'd admit it. And once he admitted it, don't worry about it anymore. Not surprisingly, the Court of Appeal indicated that that was not the purpose behind putting it and indicated that cross-examination as to prior convictions is not directly aimed at establishing the falsity of the witness's evidence. It's designed to lay down a factual basis from which the inference may subsequently be drawn that the witness's credibility is suspect and that his evidence ought not to be believed because of his misconduct and circumstances totally unrelated to those of the case in which he's giving evidence. And it's my respectful submission that it is not, as the Supreme Court of Canada asserts, logical that once an accomplice openly admits his participation, we need no longer be concerned about his credibility. The court sets out that what we must now do, rather than having an inflexible rule, is require trial judges to exercise their discretion. They're to look at all of the surrounding circumstances and consider, as the court puts it, what, what might impair the worth of a particular witness. If, in the judgment of the trial judge, the credit of a witness is such that the jury should be cautioned, he may instruct the jury accordingly. If, on the other hand, he believes that regardless of the fact that the witness is technically an accomplice, there's no special reason to be concerned about his credibility, no warning will be given. The court states that one of the major concerns is, in the past, there was no real analysis of why they were after this evidence. There was simply this mindless sort of mechanical approach, does it fit within the slots, and if it did, then that was sufficient corroboration. In England, there had been a trend to stress something that really hasn't been talked about much in Canada. In both Hester and Kilbourne, part of the reason for moving away from this approach was the fact that they held that before we even talk about corroboration, you first have to decide your suspect witness is credible. If you don't believe that suspect witness, then any amount of corroboration is not going to assist you with that difficulty. And it's my submission that if you start with that approach, that we're dealing with a witness whose evidence we basically accept, then it's easier to understand why the courts are now taking a position we need confirm some aspects of the story, but not as many as we did in the past, because as they very sensibly have also pointed out, if you have to confirm everything about the witness's story, you don't need the witness, because all the rest of the confirmatory evidence could prove the case. In the Vetrovic decision, there's not a great deal of guidance in my submission to trial courts as to what they're now to do in situations in which they feel this, that a warning is appropriate. They say that we must take a simple approach, explain to the juror in easy terms what is required of them, and tell them that perhaps a prudent juror might seek confirmation of a story before concluding it is true and adopting it in the process of finding the guilt of the accused. In a great many cases in which one formerly would have given a warning, they say we need no longer. However, the court does acknowledge what may be appropriate, however, in some circumstances is a clear and sharp warning to the jury that would attract their attention to the risks of adopting without more the evidence of a witness. There is no magic in the word corroboration nor is there in the word confirmation or support. The court also indicates that if we're dealing with particularly a long and complex trial, while it's no longer necessary to try to list all of the evidence which could provide confirmation or support, take whatever word you would like, it would probably be helpful 
to provide them with some sort of examples so they have some idea what type of evidence you feel could be supportive. Turning to the aftermath of Vetrovic, one of the things I found very surprising is there are very few cases which discuss the Vetrovic decision in detail. Given that it's now 18 months old and has abolished a rule that certainly appellate counsel knew and loved, it's somewhat surprising. But there's some basic observations which I feel can safely be made. It's clear that there is no longer a mandatory requirement for a warning. It's now a matter for discretion of the trial judge. Equally clear then, it is no longer an error of law automatically if a judge decides not to give a warning. The interesting question is, however, if you incorporate it as part of your theory of the defense that a witness may well be, war be lying and why, and the trial judge fails to charge the jury adequately on your theory of defense, that's a question of law. So it may be less of a problem getting to the Supreme Court of Canada than it looks like at first glance. As to what happened to the requirements under the old rule, I think some of them are still intact. I think it very likely, for example, that this confirmatory evidence must still deal with a fairly central issue in the case, so that the material particularity rule appears to be faring better than most of the other rules in the circumstance. With respect to the issue of identity of the accused, in light of Workington and Vetrovic, it appears that it is clear that this rule has been substantially diluted. In fact, the court at one point notes that although evidence implicating the accused directly is one form of confirmation, they say specifically it's certainly not the only form. They go on to give an example, which is exactly the facts of Murphy and Butt, where you have evidence linking one accused on the issue of identity and not the other, and they say that that's sufficient. The unanswered questions, however, is what is going to happen if you have a package of confirmatory evidence and none of it ties the identity of the accused person to this offense. And that is a situation in which you have, in my submission, the greatest possible risk. One would hope an accomplice involved in the crime could provide enough detail about a great many aspects of the offense to seem credible. After all, he was there, he should know. But dealing with the vital issue where identity of the accused is a central part of the case, be my submission that we would hope that courts would require at least some piece of evidence independent of this suspect witness that links the accused to the commission of the offense. As to whether the evidence still need be more consistent with the guilt and the innocence of the accused, it would be my submission that this rule had probably died before Vetrovic in any event. In light of the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Cooper, it probably was no longer the law in any way that you still need to prove that part of the old accomplice rule. With respect to the independence requirement, again, it appears unclear exactly what the state of that rule is going to be. It seems definite that not every piece of evidence need be independent, as it needed to be before, but it's hoped that still at least some of the evidence has independent probative value, or really what you're doing is getting other parts of the suspect witness's evidence to confirm parts you're concerned about, and that's somewhat circular in terms of providing you with a higher level of security that there is no miscarriage of justice. I've already mentioned before the fact that the people who are now subject to warnings has been dramatically lessened by the Vetrovic decision. There still are some questions which are unanswered. It appears that if somebody was actively involved in the commission of the offense, was part of subscriminus in the offense, and had not yet been tried, that even under Vetrovic, there probably would still need to be a warning. However, what we don't know is what's going to happen if you have someone who is in that position, but yet openly acknowledges that he's in his posi that position, does that then wipe out the need for concern? I would hope that it certainly would not, as I can't think of a witness who has more motive to lie, but they have not yet told us exactly what minimum standards are going to be required. As to the scope of the decision, Mr. Justice Dixon specifically states it deals with the common law regarding corroboration and accomplices. He specifically states it's not to affect statutory sections. 
Of course, if you recall, however, that Murphy and Butt and Workington developed under the old statutory sections and had already begun the dilution, I think it reasonable to expect that that's going to continue, notwithstanding his lordship's comment in that case. There have been a few statutory cases since Vetrovic, and so far I've only come across one that has even adverted to the possibility that Vetrovic has an effect on statutory matters. There's a case of Regina and McDonald, which is a court martial appeals matter in which they specifically turned to Vetrovic and said that does not alter our statutory requirements. The Court of Appeal for Ontario in two cases has not adverted to it whatever and appears to be applying the old rules. Not very many courts have yet reached appellate levels dealing with post vetrovic charges. There are, however, at least two which have reached, which had pre vetrovic charges which were considered after the release of that decision. One of them was the Burrett decision, better known in Ontario as the tainted meat case, which had gone on for a great many months. In that situation, Mr. Justice Martin looked over the charge and concluded that actually numerous pieces of evidence were left with the jury that would not have met the old tests. However, he felt that in light of Vetrovic, they would meet the new standards, and in that light, he therefore dismissed the appeal. So it would appear that for pre-Vetrovic charges considered after Vetrovic, so long as they meet the new standard, new trials will not be ordered on that basis. There's also the unreported decision of Regina and John, and one of the issues considered in that is what's happened to the old rule that you couldn't tell a jury once you have corroboration that it's safe to convict on that witness's evidence. Mr. Justice Brooke noted that none of the decisions in Ontario dealing with this issue were even mentioned in the Supreme Court of Canada, and he doubted that the Supreme Court had intended to get rid of that requirement. However, on the other hand, he said, in light of the type of wording in Vetrovic, that matter is still in doubt. And even though the trial judge had, in that case, told the jury, as soon as you find some confirmation, then don't worry about this witness anymore, the appeal was not allowed. Some emphasis appeared to be placed on the fact that there was no objection made by defense counsel, but it appears clear that it's also that they felt that Vetrovic may well have affected that rule as well. The most lengthy decision which discusses Vetrovic comes from Prince Edward Island and was released in June of this year. That was a somewhat extreme case, however, and I think has to be read in the context that that witness, the suspect witness, had such bad character that 23 witnesses were called on the issue of his terrible character. Also, it has to be kept in mind that he was clearly actively involved in the commission of the offense and had made an extremely good arrangement in terms of his prosecution. In that case, they said it was clearly an error of the trial judge not to charge himself, it was a judge alone trial, on the issue that he needed support for this witness's evidence. This witness was the sole witness to provide direct evidence against the accused in that trial. One of the other matters of great importance is the trial judge had said, the accused has to show me why this man might lie. Prince Edward Island Appellate Court looked at that and said, no, there is absolutely no onus on an accused to show us why the accomplice might lie. And that's very important. The, there's a legal research service that's provided by Legal Aid, and they've prepared a paper on this subject. And one of the conclusions in it I found a little disturbing was a suggestion that there would now be some sort of onus on defense counsel to show affirmative proof that an accomplice might be lying. And I hope that the decision in Prince Edward Island is going to be more indicative that in certain circumstances where there's a, a clear danger, you're dealing with an accomplice directly involved in the offense who has clearly very, very unsavory reputation and unreliable, that we're not then going to have to try to go out and find 23 witnesses, but that the judge will simply infer in those circumstances a warning is appropriate. There's also a very new decision of Boulay, which has come from a trial court. Unfortunately, all that is reported is a ruling in the very long trials that are going on about the Archambault murders. And 
it may well be that if more facts have been reported, my criticism of the judgment may be ill-founded. However, there appears to be nothing in that judgment that indicates the witnesses they're dealing with were accomplices. It appears there were simply other inmates of Archambault who witnessed certain events. In fact, it's clear one of them wasn't, as they noted that he was locked up in segregation at the time, and he was certainly totally uninvolved with the riot and everything else. However, notwithstanding the fact in Ontario, we just used to call these people unsavory witnesses, because they certainly didn't appear to be accomplices, the trial judgment exclusively talks in terms of the Vetrovic decision. Now, part of the reason for this, no doubt, is that the court at one point in Vetrovic talks about the kinds of concerns you have not only in dealing with accomplices, but also identification, unsavory witnesses, and other categories, complainants in rape cases, for example, are simply referred to as all requiring confirmation. However, there's no part of Vetrovic that turns its mind to the Ontario Court of Appeal cases, and there's a, a great list in this paper of mine, that deal with the need to warn about unsavory witnesses. It seems fairly clear in Ontario that if you have one of those sorts of witnesses, for example, in prison murder cases and other situations, you used to be warned that this person may well have a bad reputation and we ought to be cautious about him. However, this trial judge in Quebec looks at it, all the circumstances, and says, well, these people are all murderers and they all are in Archambault, and that's how they got to Archambault, but they don't seem to have some particular reason to lie. They seem to have nothing to gain by lying. They are going to get their parole in any event. And since I don't find any motive for them to lie, I'm not going to warn the jury in any regard about their evidence. Now, part of the reason why he did that was some concern because there were three accused. One set of witnesses identified accused A and B, and another witness identified witnesses A and C. There was confirmation for the first set of witnesses, but none whatever for the identification on the second set, and he felt that there may well be some prejudice if it was highlighted that the first identification was confirmed by a number of prison guards' evidence and the second set was not. Had this trial occurred in Ontario, it would be my submission that the law regarding disreputable witnesses still appears to exist, since there's nothing in Vetrovic which appears to change that, and one would have hoped that there would have been some warning given about these type of witnesses. Unfortunately, to date, we seem to have very little guidance, either from the courts or any learned writers, on the subject of what form Vetrovic is going to take. It appears we're going to have to wait for quite a while to see the exact impact of this very major decision. My overall view on it is one can certainly understand that the court felt matters had become overly ritualistic and complex, and even lawyers had an enormous amount of difficulty understanding these charges, and I doubt that very many juries understood them. On the other hand, it would be my submission that the Vetrovic decision certainly has opened the door for going far too far in the other direction, and a great many people about whose evidence we ought to be very, very concerned may well go in with absolutely no warning to the jury, which could lead to some very real injustices. This is particularly true in light of the increasing complexity and sophistication of cases such as drug conspiracies and fraud trials in which the Crown more and more has to rely on the evidence of an insider, an accomplice, in order to secure a conviction, notwithstanding wiretaps and all the other aids they have to infiltrate the criminal organization. So it appears that the answer is caution may have been thrown to the wind, but we don't know yet. Thank you.